gentlemen, we are going to get started momentarily, so if you all can please find your seats, that would be great. So first and foremost, I just want to welcome you. This is very exciting. This is our college panel night. I am Dr. Offord, and I am the acting principal of Wooten High School, and I'm very excited to be here this evening. Um, we have some amazing guests today, and um, this evening is going to be very exciting, extremely informative, and I'm excited for you, as this is your junior year, and we always say your junior year is your critical year. This is an opportunity for you all to really understand what are the representatives at our universities looking for in admissions, and what is it that you need to do to prepare yourself for college. So before we get started, I do want to um, have some introductions. First, I want to introduce Kathleen Carr, who is our College and Career Coordinator, and I want to thank her for her coordination of this event this evening, along with our wonderful counselors. We have Ms. Taylor, who's here, Mr. Kurtz, Mr. Varela, and Mrs. Slipkowski, and then we did have our other administrator, but I think she went to the basketball game. Um, but I do want to take an opportunity to thank each of you for all of your work in coordinating this evening. And I am going to, and I'm really excited to introduce our guests. We have some amazing folks from the University of Michigan, Drexel University, the University of Georgia, the University of Maryland, and St. Mary's College of Maryland. So we are hoping that this evening is um, very informative for you and that you will have an opportunity to um, ask questions, but I know that Ms. Taylor is our MC, and she has several questions that she's going to ask of the panel, and um, I really am excited. I'm excited, and I hope that you leave with um, some great answers and preparation for you in terms of your college preparation. So I'm going to hand it over to Ms. Taylor so we can begin our evening. Thank you. Good evening. Um, before we get started with the college panel, um, I do want to share with you a little bit about what we've been doing with your children up until this point and what we will continue to do with them um, for the college process. Uh, so we really began thinking about the college process in terms of possible career paths and majors. So last spring we met with your children and we looked at the career portion of Naviance. They did a career interest profiler where they answered 180 questions looking at their skills, their interests, um, to help them start thinking about that possible career path. We then met with them this past December, and we looked at the college portion of Naviance. Naviance is our web-based college and career counseling program. Uh, we had them start doing a college search, where they would answer some questions to help narrow down the over 4,000 colleges and universities that we have in the United States to a manageable list for them. So some of those questions asked them where would they like to attend their school. Stay on the East Coast, go to the West Coast, North, South. It asked about size, it asked about possible major. Um, so it really helped your children start thinking about criteria that was important for them when thinking about the college that they wanted to attend. At that time, we also started to work with your children on their testing calendar. Many of them have already taken an SAT or an ACT, but for those who have not, we help them plan out their spring to ensure that their testing will be done before they start applying to their colleges. Um, most recently, last week, we met with your children to begin looking at their senior schedule. Um, we asked them to start looking at schools that they thought that they might apply to to determine how many um, credits in each different discipline those colleges would require. So for instance, Montgomery County only requires three science credits, and University of Georgia, I believe you require four. So if you want to go to the University of Georgia, you better have a science class in your senior year to be a prospective applicant. So we really want them to start thinking about that process now so that they make sure their senior schedules match up with what the colleges are looking for. Next month, we will begin to meet with your children in small groups. Um, we call this our red folder meeting, uh, and we will start to really get into the nitty gritty process of the college application process, looking at what pieces um, are needed in the application um, and things like that. We will then schedule an individual meeting with your child. If you would like to attend that meeting, you are more than welcome to do that. 
during that time, we will ensure that your child has a list of schools um, that they are going to apply to that fit some criteria. So we're looking at two to three safety schools. Safety schools are where we think your child's GPA and test score are above the average that it takes to get into that school. Two to three target schools, schools where we think they're right on target with the, with the grades and the test scores, and then two to three reach schools. So we're typically encouraging students to apply to six to nine schools. And we really do want them to have this list by the time they leave for summer so that they can start to work on those applications. Applications typically become available in August. The more work that your children can do over the summer, the less stressful their fall will be once they start all their classes. Um, in April, we will have the college fair. Montgomery County puts on a college fair. Tuesday, April 2nd is the date that we will attend. We will take some buses over to the Montgomery County Fairgrounds and your children will be able to interact with the various colleges and universities to talk to their representatives and get some more information. And then lastly, next um, fall for back to school night, um, we always have a senior meeting the um, hour before back to school night starts. So at 6 p.m. that evening, we will have a college meeting for you all. You will be senior parents at that time. Um, and we will walk through the um, transcript request and teacher request process with you so that you can help your children in that process. So a lot of work has been done, but a lot more work is coming up. We will be here every step of the way to help you all, to support you in any way that we can. Um, we do encourage you to have your children come and ask us questions. That helps us build rapport with them so that we can really, um, really help them to find the right schools for them. So that's kind of what's been going on and what is to come. I am going to turn things over to Kathleen Carr now so she can introduce um, our reps and tell you a little bit about this evening. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Well, it's nice to see everybody here. What a great turnout, much appreciated. As Ms. Taylor has said, we've been doing a lot of work with your children. One um, aspect of the college process is the testing, the SATs or the ACTs. And just so you know, on April 9th, Montgomery County Public Schools will be offering a free SAT in school. You will get further information as that time approaches. Um, but in the meantime, you realize that the college process is very daunting. Um, many people will say it's overwhelming. There's many steps and many questions that we all have. And that is why we brought together this fantastic panel this evening. And hopefully they'll be able to answer a lot of your questions. So I'm actually going to introduce them by their first names and their last names and their colleges. And I thank you all for attending this evening. The first person I'd like to introduce is Erin Lish. She is the Associate Director of Freshman Admissions at Drexel. The next person I'd like to introduce is Matt Wilcox, and he is with UGA as a, a Regional Admissions Officer. Um, Megan Lang is the Assistant Director of Admissions Digital Media for St. Mary's College of Maryland. Dustin Castro is our Assistant Director of Admissions for the University of Michigan. And lastly, we have Danielle Audley joining us from the University of Maryland College Park, and she is the Coordinator of College Recruitment. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Ms. Taylor, who will begin asking questions. And thank you so much. SAT, ACT, SAT2, um, and which ones you prefer, if you prefer one. Hi everyone. Um, so at Drexel, our policy is a little different. Uh, we are what's called test flexible, meaning we require some form of standardized test but it does not need to be an SAT-1 or an ACT. Um, it could be a combination of AP or IB scores or different national exams for our students who've done time outside of the United States. Um, we will require something though, um, so we are not test optional. Um, submitting something besides the traditional SAT or ACT does not impact your financial aid or merit-based funding. 
So you would still be considered um, for all of the same things, um, whether you do a traditional SAT or ACT or um, if you submit something different. We do not require any additional testing for any of our programs like SAT choose. Um, the only program where we prefer to see them is our direct entry eight-year medical program. Um, for those students who are directly admitted to med school, um, they do like to see that extra testing. Hi, y'all. Matt Wilcox from the University of Georgia. Um, so UGA, we do the SAT or ACT. We don't have a preference between those tests, whichever is better for you. Uh, we do super score those, so we'll take the best combination of if you've taken the SAT or the ACT more than once. Um, we'll give you the best combination of those if you send us all your test scores. For us, sending us multiple test scores can't hurt your possible admission to Georgia. It can only help your chances by sending us everything you've got. Um, I guess the only other thing is we do have to have the official test scores for the SAT or the ACT sent to us. Um, we can't self report those. So. Hey, everyone. Uh, just a reminder. Uh, so we don't have a preference between the ACT or SAT, and they actually kind of take a backseat in our application. We're looking more at the rigor that you took in your course load um, and your recommendations and your essays. But uh, we aren't test optional, so we do have to get that official copy. It can come from College Board directly, or you can have your school counselor submit their report of your scores as well. Um, and we also will super score. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dustin Castro from University of Michigan. We will also accept either the ACT or the SAT. We don't prefer one over the other. Students can send in SAT twos. They're not required, but they could make an application more competitive, especially like say if the students wanting to go into a specialized program like say engineering. Um, we don't super score in the traditional sense, but if you send us multiple test scores, it's not going to hurt you at all. We're always going to be looking at the highest test scores, and um, although we're not going to be coming up with a new composite or a new uh, total score for you, we will always be considering your highest sub scores. Good evening, everyone. Again, my name is Danielle from the University of Maryland. Um, so, the University of Maryland does require either the SAT or the ACT. We don't. We also don't have a preference. It's really up to the student, but we do need something officially from College Board or ACT. We cannot accept them self-reported or from counselors. It has to be directly from the testing center. And just a little note, make sure you send it to the right University of Maryland for us, because there's a lot of University of Maryland's around here. Um, so make sure you get the right code from the school. Um, we don't require the written part for either exam. Um, we also don't require the SAT2 or subject exams. We do super score both the SAT or the ACT, so we'll take the highest of each section and make a new composite. Um, and similarly, you know, if we're asking, we're asking you to send all of your scores, that is not going to look at all poorly upon you if you score lower on one test versus the other or whatnot. You've got to remember at the end of the day, we are all humans. Um, we have hearts and uh, we are looking to find reasons to admit your students. We're not looking for reasons to not admit you. Um, so we want you to just send us everything. Again, we're at super score all of it. Um, and then another part, um, for AP testing, um, that's not something using the admissions process. That's something more of you would get credit once you're already at the university. So um, that's all about Maryland's testing. Can you just raise your hand? How many of you require the writing section? So George is the only one. Okay, thank you. Um, if we can talk a little bit about the transcript. When you are looking at the transcript, students always ask me, are they going to look at my cumulative GPA, my weighted GPA? What are you looking for in that transcript? Um, so for us uh, as a university, we do have 15 colleges. Um, each of our colleges do have slightly different criteria that we're looking for um, because we do admit our students directly to their major they've selected um, if they are admissible to that college. Um, as far as the GPA and the transcripts, um, each of those colleges have different prerequisite courses, so engineering or computer science, for example. We're looking at higher level maths and sciences for those students than we would for our College of Arts and Sciences, for example. Um, we're looking at your individual grades and the level of coursework, the rigor of coursework, like everybody will say all down the line up here. Um, we're looking at 
what types of courses you've taken, and your transcripts are really nice because they have both a weighted and unweighted GPA, so we can see both. Um, for us, we don't preference one over the other. Um, if both are listed, we will look at both of those to see what your raw GPA is in your courses and then what your weighted is with the rigor that you've taken um, relative to the curriculum available at your school. So something that I guess any of us could have said, or we can all say, um, for each of these answers, we should start with across colleges, it depends. <laughs> and it's going to vary from school to school, and you're getting that from us here. Um, when we're looking at transcripts at the University of Georgia, we're looking, again, we'll talk a lot about rigor. We're looking to see if you've pursued a rigorous course load given what's available to you. Uh, we want to see what kind of trends there are. So if you've been awesome the whole time, that's a good trend. If first year wasn't that great, but we've been awesome since, we like to see that. We don't really want to see the other direction so much. Um, and GPA for us, we do a recalculated weighted core GPA. Everybody knows what that is? Okay. That's the jokes, folks. I can bet. <laughs> yeah, so for us, uh, rigor is definitely a huge part of our application process. Being an honors college, we do expect our students to be interested in uh, their academic program and highly pushing themselves towards their like acquisition of knowledge. So um, here, I, you know, you guys have tons of options in terms of AP courses. So if we get an applicant and they have to use a single AP course, that's kind of a red flag for us. But at a school where maybe only three are offered, if a person doesn't take a single AP, it's not as much of a red flag. So yeah, motto of the night is it depends. But <laughs> um, in terms of rigor, we are looking for those AP courses, the IB courses, and then also it kind of bleeds into extracurriculars. We will take into account academic extracurriculars, like things like Model UN, um, working in tutoring positions, things of that nature do come into play as well. So for the University of Michigan, when we receive a transcript, uh, we're going to unweight it and recalculate it. So any A plus, A, or A minus is now just a flat A similar for B plus B, B minus is now just a flat B, and then we recalculate the GPA based off of that. So students and parents might be wondering why I'm worried about AP classes, right? If we're going to take all the weight out. Well, similar to the other institutions, we're going to look at your rigor. You know, we want to make sure that students are taking a, a rigorous course load. But when it comes to um, the, the transcript and the rigor, we do like to take them in consideration of each other, but independently still want to see you taking those rigorous courses, but we also want to see you getting good grades in those courses. Finally, at College Park, so very similar. Um, so we are looking for us, we will take your GPA weighted as it is on the transcript, but just know we are, you know, more heavily focusing on what grades you're earning in what classes, are you taking rigorous classes in the context of your school, um, and with that, it doesn't mean that you have to take all that's offered, we take it into the context of the person. The example I always like to use is if you were a three-sport athlete, I was an athlete, if you're a three-sport athlete, you may not be able to take the maximum number of APs because you were consumed with some extracurriculars, maybe you're involved in the club here or there. So it's kind of that balance of taking rigorous classes, um, but again, taking it into the context of who you are. We also take into consideration of trend and things of that nature. Um, and something I do want to highlight about trends if there was some sort of hiccup on high school or something that didn't go so well, a grade, um, you can't hide it, we see it. Um, so don't pretend that it's not there. Um, it would be in your best interest to explain it. Even if it's a simple, I wasn't mature, or if there was some medical reasons or some family things, students, whatever you're comfortable with, but we would rather have more information than less, because again, we're going to see it. it you can't get rid of it, it's there. But one, once we have more information, that can kind of help gauge, you know, is that something for concern or not? Um, so again, it's kind of looking at not just the number of the GPA, we're looking at the, the rigor, the courses you're taking. Um, rigor in terms of honors, AB, IB, college courses are all look good to us. They're all increasing the rigor in some capacity, but again, always keeping in the context of who you are as a student, what are, you, what are you doing outside the classroom as well to kind of keep that in mind as to what's on your plate in general. So I'm assuming you all are gonna answer this question in the same way, so only one of you has to answer it. The question I get from students is, is it better to get an A in honors or a B in AP? It's better to get an A in an AP. <laughs> <laughs> that was not one of the choices. 
choice is given, but thank you. Um, before we go on to the next question, which I'm going to ask you a little bit about how you evaluate the applicant, um, I do want to take a step back, and I apologize, audience, we should have given them each a couple of minutes to tell you a little bit about their university and um, what makes them unique. So we'll start with the University of Maryland. All right. So. University of Maryland at College Park, so we are the flagship institution of the state of Maryland. So what that means, because students I'm learning, you don't know what flagship means anymore. Um, essentially, we are oldest, largest, and one of the top academically. So um, at College Park, um, we do have about 29,000 undergrads or so and about 10,000 graduate students. So we're on the larger side course relative to wherever else you're looking um, and with that comes a lot of different opportunities so we have more than 90 different majors um, all different areas and they're grouped into one of our 12 academic colleges we also have the option of being undecided which is called letters and sciences for us um, students have the opportunity a lot of our students take advantage of study abroad as well as um, um, internships and research opportunities and all those amazing outside the classroom opportunities to kind of get that real world experience um, and then in general, I think one of the couple things that make us unique, um, and you all know this by living here, but you know, having DC right there um, is, a, is a really um, special part of College Park. And I know you all know this by living here, but I think it takes a whole new meaning once you go into college, because that opens a whole world of opportunities in terms of internships, um, research opportunities, the connections with the university, and then just your experience of continuing to go to events and, and um, things that are happening in our nation's capital, which is amazing. Um, the other thing at College Park, I'm not sure if anybody else has this, but when we're looking at students, we actually consider 26 different factors. Not listing them all for you, but they are uh, listed directly on our website. So if you ever want to see them, we'll, we will show you exactly and be very honest and open. These are the 26 factors that we're looking at. Um, and I told your staff earlier, I don't sit there with like a check to go through each factor, but it's more of as we get ready to review applicants, we kind of get in the mindset of, okay, we want to create and bring in a very diverse class in many different ways who are academically talented, going to do amazing things at the university, and have all these different experiences and backgrounds and can really form a great um, conversation in classes. So we kind of get in the mindset of like, okay, here's all the different things that we consider when we're reviewing applicants. So I think it's a great place. It's a very diverse place with a lot of opportunities for the students. And what's nice is as uh, students who are not too far away, it's great because Maryland is like its own little world over there. Uh, you can be pretty close to home, but you can still feel like you're in your own little world. So it's a, it's a pretty awesome place. The University of Michigan uh, is located in Ann Arbor, Michigan. It's about 40 minutes or so west of Detroit. We are a land, uh, sea, and space grant institution. We're one of the few uh, universities in the United States that has a top-ranked law, medical, engineering, and business school, all on the same campus. And all of our individual schools and colleges, there's 19 total, all of them work together when it comes to uh, various aspects of research. Just last year alone, uh, the University of Michigan spent over $1.5 billion on research. So it, that's a quite a lot of money. We are, very, uh, we are very oriented toward research. So we do a very good job of uh, preparing students for graduate school, professional school, and just life in general. I like to say that the University of Michigan is a place where we work hard and play hard. Um, there's over 1,500 different clubs and organizations that you can get involved in. So anything from feeding squirrels to jumping out of a perfectly good airplane to Baja racing to whatever it might be, all of that's available to you. Um, I absolutely enjoyed, like I just loved my time at Michigan. I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. And if you haven't visited, I would encourage you to do so. I know in Maryland there's this idea that southeastern Michigan, it's kind of like the tundra. You know, like I heard we just got about 10 inches of snow over the weekend. That's, that's what you could probably expect in southeastern Michigan, so it's not too different. So if you haven't visited, I, I would encourage Yeah, so St. Mary's College of Maryland, uh, we are affectionately known as the hidden gem within the state school system. Uh, we are a public institution and we're also the National Public Honors College. So it's a really unique uh, intersection between a lot of different college experiences that we get to bring together into one campus. 
So a lot of people get a little confused when we say an honors college, and what we mean by that is different from some larger universities that have separate sort of programs within their college that are designated as honors, our entire campus is a true honors community. So every single student at St. Mary's is part of the honors program. Um, part of what that means is that while they're in the classroom, they are doing things that might be a little bit different than your standard lecture hall type setup. Um, we have a lot of experiential learning. We're actually just starting to implement a new curriculum called LEAD, which is learning through um, experimental and applied discovery. So all of our professors are sort of focused on turning our courses into things that um, are basically research opportunities, uh, resume builders, being able to go out into the community and do skills-based learning as opposed to sitting in a lecture hall. So it's definitely a different learning experience. We're also like the token small school of tonight. <laughs> um, we're only about 2,000 students, um, really more towards like 1,600 students are on campus. Uh, about half of our students do a study abroad experience, which is why I mentioned on campus. Um, so we have tons of people across the country that are at St. Mary's. Uh, so it's a really interesting kind of microcosm of small school while still being in a very rural environment, um, having that true community feel that sometimes isn't accomplished at larger institutions. Hi, y'all. Um, again, I work at the University of Georgia. Usually I start by saying we're a big school, but Michigan's here. <laughs> <laughs> and we're big in Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we are also an R1 top research institution. We're located in Athens, Georgia, which is about an hour outside of Atlanta. Uh, if you get a chance to visit Athens, it's a really special place. Uh, cool coffee shops and restaurants and art and music. I went there for my undergraduate degree when I was 17. I stayed for the next 17 years. Uh, I'm a big fan of Athens. Uh, otherwise, you know, a lot of the things that you can say about other big state flagships is true about us. Lots of schools and colleges and opportunities, but a, a sort of a different uh, Georgia feel. Hi everyone, I'm Erin. Um, so Drexel is the odd man out, I think, in this group today. Um, so Drexel University is urban. Uh, we are right downtown in the great city of Philadelphia. Go birds. No one, whatever. It's fine, all right. Um, best city, because they don't pretend to be anything other than they are, which is great. Um, we are also an R1 research institution. Fun fact, out of the thousands of schools, there are only 134, and there are only 30, um, excuse me, 130, and 34 of them are private. We are one of them. Um, we have about 16,000 undergraduates on our campus. Um, we have students from all over the world. What makes us unique um, uh, is that we've had what's called cooperative education for exactly 100 years. This is our 100th year anniversary this year. What that means is all of our students graduate with at least six to 18 months of work experience. Often that's paid. The average salary is about 17,000 per six months of full-time work. And those placements are done through the university and they are global. So students actually do take time from their studies for a six month period and go work for an employer somewhere in the world in their field. Um, we found that this is really invaluable and really enriches and kicks up the classroom environment on our campus uh, because our faculty aren't the only experts on campus, our students are too. So you can be in a finance class and your professor could be lecturing and doing a project with you and maybe you too have worked at Goldman Sachs for six months to a year as well and you have a true and valid opinion to offer to the discussion because you saw what they were doing a couple months ago while you were there. Um, we are a D1 athletics team, as are many of the others on the panel tonight. Um, and we're really proud of our location in Philly because we're very well connected to DC, but also to New York and the Boston areas. Um, so we're right in the center of the East Coast and we find that's very useful for our students. Um, we're also the first um, school of entrepreneurship in the country. Um, we're ranked in the top 50 internationally for most patents held by a university. Um, so entrepreneurial pursuits, regardless of your major, is a very big piece of the identity of our campus as well. Thank you. So now we can talk a little bit about how you evaluate the application. How many people read it? Is it done in a group? Is it individual? And if we can start with the American. Um, so at St. Mary's we are a smaller office and we get uh, considerably less applications than some of our counterparts 
here. So we actually have an initial reader who is probably the person that you met with in your high school. So in terms of territory management, the people that you're meeting on the road are the ones that are going to be reading your application. Um, so if you're at a college fair, you might want to think hard about what you're saying to the person behind the table sometimes. <laughs> Um, so they will read your application. If you are a clear admit, then you are admitted. Um, if you're kind of more on the bubble, as we like to say, you'll go towards a committee. So um, once they go to committee, you'll be read or reviewed by um, the director of admissions and two counselors that are not the territory manager. So overall, if you're kind of on the bubble of someone that we would admit, there will be four people reading your application. Um, when we are reading the application, as I said, um, originally SAT scores or ACT scores take a little bit more of a backseat for us. Um, the biggest component in our application is the rigor of your transcript and your unweighted GPI. Um, so those are the big things. But we do really strongly encourage extracurriculars. Uh, passion is a huge thing at St. Mary's. Uh, our like little campus logos keep St. Mary's weird. Um, so every single person has their niche thing, and we're there to let them pursue it. So if you can demonstrate passion and excitement, that really resonates with all of us. Michigan. Uh, so at Michigan, there are six things that we look at in an application. Three of them are academic, and then three of them are personal. The three academic things are really the backbone of your application. That would be your curriculum, which courses you've taken, GPA, and your test score. But like I said, it's, it's truly just the backbone of your application. Many students who apply to the university are very well qualified. So more and more, as I'm going on years and years in the admissions office, what we're finding is that personal um, letters of recommendation, your extracurricular activities, and your essays, those three aspects that make up the personal side of your application, help send students to the top. Right? And what I mean by that is that helps students stand out. Um, your application is read at least twice, one from a, a reader who could be reading applications from all over the world. The second one would be me, I. Uh, and then the third one, if the reader and I disagree, that, that would go on to, to someone else to kind of like be a tiebreaker. Um, but the, the important thing when it comes to Michigan's admissions process, I would say, is that your application is truly your interview. You know, this is really where you want to spill everything it is about you. This is where you don't want to repeat what I can already glean from your transcripts, your extracurriculars, so on and so forth. Because truly, once I've gotten through your letters of recommendation, once I've gotten through your transcripts and your test scores, I kind of have a pretty good idea of who you are as a student. So I'm depending on you to add the panache, to add the showmanship, to say, this is why I belong at Michigan, this is what Michigan can do for me, and this is what I can do for Michigan. Marilyn? So at the University of Maryland, um, last year we got about 34,000 applications, um, and we have about 20 to 25 readers. So, I want to start by letting you know that you do have a territory manager right now. We're in the, in the process of transitioning to a new territory manager for Montgomery County. But um, what's nice about our territory is that, yes, your territory manager is a good point of contact. But in our office, that's not the person who's necessarily reading your application. Um, any of those readers could be reading your application. So all of our readers can read anywhere from you know Maryland to Hawaii, and we read international as well. So. Um, all of us do kind of review, um, you know, it gets an initial read and then there's multiple reviews after that. So you're, the applications are getting reviewed multiple, multiple times. Um, as many of you might have already seen, there was a Washington Post article that talked a little bit about our review committee. I see a few heads. Um, and that we do have review committee twice a week. Um, and this is essentially where if we're reviewing an applicant and we're not quite sure what to do, um, we bring that applicant to committee and we will discuss all the different components um, of the application and kind of try to decipher what we should do with that applicant. Um, again, keeping those 26 factors in our minds, um, what do we think? You know, first and foremost, um, you've always got to remember, you're applying to an academic institution. So first and foremost, we've got to be very confident that we feel like you'd be successful at the university. So although our process is holistic, where there's all these different components, the ones that do play a little bit more of a larger weight, just a smidge, is the academics 
as a whole. So grades, test score, rigor, all those, just to get that academic base to make sure that we feel that, you're com that we're confident you can be successful at the university. Um, then that's where the, all those other components come into assist as well. But again, we really truly do, right before reading season, we get into the mindset of here's the 26 factors, let's remember all these um, and, and go, go start reading. Um, just as you heard, you know, that at, at Maryland, interviews are not part of our process, so exactly that. You should use the application to put your best foot forward and put everything you want us to know right there. Um, if there's something in particular you want to make sure that we know, I know a lot of times students would email their territory managers, which is fine, but also make sure you put it on the application because, again, um, the territory manager may not be the person reading your application, so you want to make sure whoever's reading it has that information. So I always tell students put it in the additional information section, put it at the end of the essay, like wherever it needs to go, make sure it's in there so everybody who's reading it gets all that information and nothing is being missed. Um, but definitely just put your best foot forward in there. Um, and again, it gets reviewed multiple, multiple times by the university. Drexel. Um, so at Drexel, we review first on a territory basis. So I would review your application because I'm the territory manager. Um, as a couple of my other colleagues have said, if you are um, a very compelling applicant at that point, then you could just be admitted and um, go through one final double check later down the line, but that kind of is where your journey ends, right there. Um, likewise, or if you are not admissible um, and not really kind of in that middle ground, um, for the majority of students that are, um, someone said, within the bubble or um, are in kind of the middle of being a really compelling applicant but not quite at the very top tier, um, they go to a college-based committee. So we do have different committees um, keeping in mind the needs of the different college and different types of majors. So we have one for our College of Arts and Design, for example. We have a separate one for our engineering college. Um, so we're keeping the different factors and the holistic things that we're looking for in students um, in a little bit of a different lens. Um, as far as we're concerned, we do value the rigor and the academics piece. Um, that's the very first thing I always look at is going to be your transcripts. Um, however, we are a very active campus and we are, if any of you took a sticker, our tagline is ambition can't wait because we really want you to be out in the world now as soon as you get to campus. So we're really looking for people who are go-getters, not necessarily in the sense of that you're leading every organization, but that you have a little extra kind of like spunk that you're wanting to go into the world, you're wanting to try things, you're willing to fail and learn from your mistakes. Um, we really value those characteristics in students. Um, some of our best applicants are those that maybe didn't do well in their beginning years in high school and learned from that and became a really strong all-around student and a really strong citizen of their school. Um, those are the types of people that you're looking to admit. Um, I travel to this territory as well, so you will be dealing with me from this event here all the way up until hopefully you're admitted. So I definitely welcome questions in the future when I run into you again. Hey, so we we need something pretty similar to what Michigan does. I want to talk about something else real quick about not our how we review applications, but you, you mentioned to let us know what's going on in your application, really use it as your voice. We pulled some data on how long our applicants spend working on their application. We can keep an eye on this. And we saw that students who spent one to two weeks working on it versus students who spent two to four weeks working on it. The students who spent twice as long, up to four weeks, are almost twice as admissible to Georgia. And that might be those of the careful students who are really polishing every bit of it, and they're careful in everything they do. But we notice it, it sort of levels off a bit. But take some time, really spend on your application, and when you're writing about, you know, you're, you're on the lacrosse team, think about poor Matt from Georgia who doesn't know anything about lacrosse. You've got to tell us what clubs you're in, what these clubs do, what, what it means to be the secretary of, you know, Model UN, because I might not have done Model UN and might not know. And it's your chance to really let us know about those things so that the cool things that you're doing really shine for the person reading your application. Thank you. This next question, you all may have some similar answers, so you don't all have to answer. Um, but there are different ways students can apply. Early action, rolling, early decision. If you can talk about the application processes that you have and explain what they are, then we can start with Georgia. So, 
start with Georgia, and then if anyone has something else to add, then you guys can pop it. Georgia, that sounds cool. All right, uh, so at University of Georgia, we do early action, um, early action applications. It's a full application. It's just early. Uh, there's no preference to early action or regular decision for us. Um, they send the whole application. We look at a couple of factors, uh, rigor, grades, uh, test scores, and then we make a decision that the very top, most academically qualified students in that offer them admission. Uh, students who are close to that will pull into the regular decision pool. Regular decision, same thing, send us a full application. Um, that we're going to do a holistic review of. And it's, again, not any difference in sort of what we're looking for in the student. It's just a different time period to do it and how we're going to review those applications. Um, and that's it for us, just early action, not minding, just early. Regular decision, regular decision. So Drexel actually has a buffet of all three options. So we have early decision, which is binding. We have early action, both of which are um, due on the same deadline, and they both find out at the same time. The difference is early decision makes your decision for you early, and early action is just you taking action early. So that's a good way to remember it. Feel free to steal it. Um, regular decision, we have that as well, just like UGA. Um, so that is also non-binding, and it's a little bit of a later deadline. We also do not preference students for admission or for scholarship based off of what timeline they apply under. So everybody is considered the same way. Um, and so it's just really a matter of preference for the student when you feel most ready to put your best foot forward for us. Um, we do receive about 30 to 32,000 applications per year. Um, this year, they've actually been pretty evenly split uh, between the early pool and the regular decision round. So any of you that feel like you're going to play your odds, there's not really either that's better. So. And I'll just you know, be the one who doesn't follow the rules. Um, we have two deadlines, um, one of which is very similar to early action, but sorry. College Park calls it the priority deadline. Um, but it's very similar to early action, that it's early, but it's not binding. Um, our deadline every year, so juniors, it'll be the same next year, is November 1st. That's our priority deadline. And for us, you know, some institutions, it's just, you know, it's a little bit earlier, you find out earlier. But for Maryland, that priority deadline is actually very, very important. Because in that priority deadline, there's three main reasons why we um, promote it. Number one, students have their best consideration for admission to the university if they apply by November 1. Um, I will let you know that we do take about 90% of our incoming freshmen in that first poll. So let's do the math. How much is left in the next deadline? 10%. Yeah, good math. Um, yeah, so not impossible, but you got a lot smaller of a window uh, of a percentage there. So most of the applicants are getting picked from that pool, so regular deadline gets a lot more competitive. Um, you're not only debating, uh, battling a competitive pool, but now you're battling space as well. The second reason is by November 1st, you have your best consideration for some of our special programs. So we do have the Honors College, College Park Scholars. Um, these are living and learning programs where students live together and take classes together. Um, and again, you have your best consideration by November 1st. And then the last one, I think this is the most important, students slash parents, do you want to be considered for free money? Why are you delayed on that? It's free money. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, thank you. I don't, yeah, I'll take your free money. Um, yes, uh, you want free money. Um, if you apply by November 1st, you are automatically considered. Um, if you miss that deadline, there's literally nothing I can do because the way that the timeline works and scholarship review happens, if you don't apply and complete by that deadline, you've missed the boat. Uh, even if you are a perfect test score, perfect grades, and you apply in the regular, I can't do anything for you. So November 1st is huge for us. Um, students get notified by February 1st. They, if you apply earlier, it's just more of you have plenty of time to check in on your application. You don't hear back any earlier. Um, and then our regular deadline is January 20th. Students hear back by um, April 1st. That deadline, um, again, no scholarship consideration. Special programs is kind of iffy. And your um, chances of getting in are just a little bit more competitive. Um, but again, we only have the two options, so priority and regular. Um, University of Michigan has early action deadline of November 1st, uh, so if you get all of your application materials in by November 1st, we will give you a decision by December 24th, because that's what we like to give news, right? Um, so, 
During early action, you could receive one of three decisions. Admit, obviously the best, you're a Wolverine, let's go blue. Um, deny, we typically defer, or excuse me, deny very few students in early action. And then the third decision would be what we call a defer. What defer means is that based off of the strength of our early action class, and this year we had just about 40,000 applications for EA, we're not quite sure of your strength within that class, so we're going to defer you into regular decision. So if you get deferred into regular decision, you could hear a decision by, like, say, um, mid-April. So our regular decision deadline is just February 1st. You might be wondering, should I apply EA by November 1st or regular decision by um, February 1st? Similar to Maryland, though not to that extent, we're seeking to enroll a little over half of our class from EA. So if Michigan is one of those schools that you're looking at, I would encourage you to apply EA because you know, we're, we're going to have that opportunity to develop a relationship. You're going to be used to who I am and feel comfortable reaching out and saying, hey, Dustin, I'm still very much interested in Michigan, so on and so forth. And then I use that to advocate for you on your behalf. If you just choose to apply for regular decision, I'm still going to do my best to advocate for you, but like I said, the, the number of seats, much fewer, um, and if there's only two admissions decisions you could receive, that would be either admit or deny. Yeah, so um, our school offers all three, so you can do early decision, early action, or regular decision. Um, as explained, early decision is the binding one. However, early decision and early action are the same deadline for us. So this year they're both November 1. Um, it's really up to the student whether you're committing or you just want to know earlier. Um, in both, you do have the option to be deferred to regular decision, so you have kind of like that second chance to get in. Um, whereas if you apply regular decision, you're not getting notified until April 1, and there's also nothing else after that. Um, but in terms of preferences for applying earlier, uh, we do like to look favorably upon our early decision students. Um, it looks good to us that you are so devoted to St. Mary's that you would choose to enroll if you were admitted. Um, so those uh, admit rates that tend to be a little bit higher uh, as opposed to early action or regular decision. But as, on the student side, for you guys, there's no um, preference in terms of competing for housing, competing for uh, registration or classes of that sort. We offer guaranteed housing all four years and all that good stuff. Thank you. So I'm going to do a double question here. Um, one is, our students are required to have two years of a world language in order to graduate from Luton. Um, a lot of our students will have that completed by the end of their eighth grade, so it's done before they enter high school. Are you okay if you require two years that being in middle school? Do you want to see world language on their transcripts in their high school years? That would be the first question. The second question. Um, for our students sitting here, um, as rising seniors, they have several options for their senior course load. They can take a full course load here where they take seven courses here at Wooten. Um, second option is they can do some classes here at Wooten and an internship. And then the third option is classes here at Wooten and then do dual enrollment with Montgomery College. So if you can answer the question about world language and then also that senior schedule, and we will start with Michigan. Um, so, <laughs> uh, foreign language in middle school, um, I kind of want to just talk about foreign language like as a whole. Um, the, inside of the University of Michigan, only the College of Literature, Science, and the Arts, the Liberal Arts College, requires you to have foreign language in high school and to take foreign language while you're in college in order to earn your degree. Having said that, there are volumes of research that show that the more you study a foreign language, the better you are going to do, not only like in your English classes, but also on standardized tests like the ACT and SAT. So when it comes to us evaluating your foreign language, if you're applying to the College of Literature, Science, and the Arts, that's the only one where it's a hard, you need to have at least uh, two years. And for us, if you take it in middle school, and it shows up on your high school transcript, that's okay, okay? Um, what many of the students who apply and admit, are admitted to Michigan will do is that they'll take their middle school foreign language, but then they'll continue on into their regular high school years. 
The second question being AP versus dual enrollment thing and internship. Uh, the first one I'd like to talk about would be the internship. When we're reviewing an application, we, we really want to see students who are taking full advantage of the rigor that's available to them. Our belief and our faculty members' belief is that when it comes to work experience, you're going to get that at Michigan. So your time in high school should really be devoted toward learning. So in that sense, that we would really prefer you to double or not down, but instead of taking an internship, take more AP or perhaps go in toward the dual enrollment for you know, a local college. Um, when we're reviewing applications, I like to kind of consider AP and dual enrollment more or less the, the same when it comes to rigor. Um, but I would say that it's, it's easier for me to compare students like apples to apples when they're mostly taking the AP courses, if that makes sense. Yeah? Thank you. Marilyn. Um, okay, so the foreign language. So, um, at, in the University System of Maryland, there's certain courses and requirements that we need to make sure students have. Um, part of being the two year foreign language. So, although um, many students get that kind of checked off in middle school, and it won't um, cause you to not be admitted, but we do prefer that you still take two years of foreign language in high school. Um, same thing with math. Math is one of those other. Um, classes that's required by the state, four years of math. And, and the main point of that, just so you all know, it's not for those who hate math, like my husband, that to just push through it. It's so that when you go to college, typically you're gonna have to at least take a math class. They wanna make sure you're continuing with the trend and you're not losing those skills to then cause you to fall on your face when you get to college. So that's another one where we really would prefer that you still take that fourth year math to kind of keep up with it and to prepare for college. Um, now in terms of the AP, the dual curriculum, the internship. Um, with that, it's kind of up to the student. As long as you have reasons for what you're doing, we're okay with it. Um, whatever courses you do take your senior year, we want to see trying to increase the rigor. But if you decide to spend some of your time doing the internship for Maryland, that's okay. Like I said, we prefer you at least still have that math course or any final requirements and try to keep up with some sort of rigor to kind of keep you on pace to go into college. Um, but for us, um, you know, whatever you choose, as long as you have a reason for what you're doing, um, you're not just doing it because it's like, hey, I just want to do this internship just because it's easy. You know, as long as you have reasons behind it, we, we support you. But like I said, just we would encourage in some capacity to try to continue with the rigor just so that there's not that gap and then you go into college. You're continuing in some capacity. Even if it's a lesser load, you're still preparing for your college level courses. So I would say that for us, the perfect combination is maybe one or two APs and an internship. Um, for us, we really are looking at you as a future change maker and someone that's going to be employed and be out in the world as early as your sophomore year full time with us. So internships are really valuable um, and we value that because of the type of institution we are. So again, it depends. Um, the biggest mistake I see of a lot of students, particularly in this area, because there's internships offered at some other neighboring schools too, is that you list it on your activities, and I have no idea what the company is, you don't describe what you did, you could have had a really enriching experience and a really good professional view of a particular discipline or area, and you've told me absolutely nothing about it other than just list to the organization you worked with. Um, so you, you're diminishing the work that you've done throughout that whole year because I now know nothing about what you've accomplished. On the flip side of that, if you take an AP or a dual enrollment, there's documentation for that. So I can see that very easily. You don't need to reiterate that. Um, but if you are doing internships, do play that up regardless of the school you're applying to. We want to know those outside school things you're doing. Um, whatever you choose will be evaluated and none of the three options will harm you. Um, none of them is better than the other as far as we're concerned. Once you've tapped out kind of the prerequisites for the major you're applying to, for us, um, we do view internships favorably. For foreign languages, we do not have a requirement in high school. 
Um, with that being said, we don't need it for admission, but if you're looking at particular majors like international business or global studies, things like that, when you're on campus with us, there are some language requirements, so obviously those are easier if you have some more recent classes in those languages. Um, and then for co-op, it's also useful as well. So if you want to be a corporate translator in China for Apple, you obviously need to have knowledge of the language you're translating. So um, the, the more years you have, the better it makes you, the more marketable it makes you, but we don't have a requirement for it. Yeah, it's a big world. It takes some foreign language. AP <laughs> uh, hey or dual enrollment. Whatever, it's fine. Take, uh, we want you to choose the most rigorous path available to you. We want you to challenge yourselves because we want to see you've been successful doing that. So we think that you'll be successful at the university. Yeah, so foreign language is a little more art school. We would definitely stress that. Um, we do have a foreign language requirement once you get to St. Mary's. So taking foreign language, especially your junior and senior year, make sure that you have still like kept up with that language skill and you're ready to take that college level course. Um, so I would recommend that you would take it in high school even if it did satisfy um, your requirements in middle school. Same with math. We do have a general math requirement as well, so I would keep going through. Uh, I really lucked out, I'll speak from the student side of this, uh, my high school offered dual enrollment. And if you're weighing the options between doing dual enrollment and doing APs and you're not as strong of a test taker, at St. Mary's, we will only accept credit for AP, AP tests that you got a four or five on. Um, so with dual enrollment, as long as you had a good passing grade, you will get credit for that at St. Mary's. Um, so I really did a lot of dual enrollment my senior year and was actually able to graduate from St. Mary's a whole year early because of it. Um, I did have some AP credits thrown in there, but I definitely felt like it was almost, like definitely, more definite that I was gonna get that credit if I did the dual enrollment. So that's what I took advantage. Thank you. Um, so moving on to the college essay, can you talk a little bit about what you're looking for, maybe give some do's and don'ts, um, and we can start with Meryl. Okay, so I will start this by letting you know that this is another one where you can, you're going to ask every single one of us, you can ask every admissions officer, they might all look for different things. Um, I was actually on a panel where we did uh, a mock review where we had uh, an applicant and the essay started with like a, a sound word, like pop. Um, one of us thought it was awesome and it was a good grabber. The other one was like, oh, I hate when that happens. So you're going to get a lot of mixed, mixed signals. So take all these with a grain of salt. But um, when we're looking, um, what I can say in general is yes, of course we're looking for your English ability. We're seeing that you can, you know, you're going to college, you're going to be writing, writing papers. So the main point of this is to be able to see how you articulate yourself and how you write and things of that nature. But am I going comma crazy and tense crazy? Absolutely not. Um, as long as it is well written and I can easily follow it, that's kind of the general structure of what I'm looking for. Um, but honestly, when I'm reading these essays, I'm looking to get to know you. I'm looking to see maybe what's something um, about you that is not evident anywhere else in the application or kind of what makes you stand out or makes me remember you. Um, and I know when I was sitting in your shoes, um, writing the college essay was like one of the hardest things um, because I, I lived a pretty privileged life. I didn't have too many terrible things happen. And, um, and although, yes, there, there are a lot of students and applicants that I'm sure we all read that have had very um, terrible obstacles in their way and things that have happened in their life, but not everybody has that. So then you sit there and go, what the heck do I write about? Um, and it doesn't have to be anything brain buster. So let me tell you my favorite essay of all time. Um, if you boil down to like the actual topic of what the student wrote about, it was actually just about her birthday. That was it. Uh, it was about her birthday. Um, but what the student did was she talked about, now her birthday, and I'll give you some context. The student's birthday was September 11th. Uh, she happened to get a reviewer who is from New York, was in New York during that time, whose father was in the city that day, he was okay, um, but I have a very, like an immediate emotional response to when I read anything about September 11th. So I was totally hooked once I found out when this girl's birthday was. Um, but the whole point of the essay was her, you know, because parents, these students don't know about September 11th from personal experience, what I've learned, um, which is scary, but, um, uh, what, what she was talking about was how when she was younger she never appreciated like 
why people are sad on this day, why people didn't want to celebrate her birthday, and all these sorts of things, and how she grew up to realize the importance of that day and kind of why uh, people had the feelings that they did, and just how she grew. But again, if you boil it down to it, she talked about her birthday. That was it. She just talked about her perspective and her growth as a, as a person and how she developed. Um, so I always like to remind students, like, make it well written. You have counselors and wonderful teachers and parents to support you. So have someone look it over. It always helps have a, a second look. I mean, as professionals, we all do that. You have someone read over your things. Um, but just make sure you you just put something out there that's either you need to your growth, your perspective, your point of view, your special story, just something so that we learn about you. Um, especially at the, um, universities that we can take applicants to committee, you gotta remember, um, especially for those of us who don't have interview processes. When I have to bring a student to committee, I'm a lot more likely to be able to fight harder for you if I feel like I know you and the essay is usually a really good point for me to feel more connected to you. So use it to your advantage. That's what I'm really looking for you to kind of point out what makes you you. So this is my favorite question because I used to teach high school English, so keep that in mind when you send your essay. Um, Drexel is a common app school, so we only require the one essay, so you just have that one essay, which is both a blessing for you, and also you just have that one essay. Um, we don't interview because of the volume of our application pool, so as all of my colleagues have been saying, this really gives us a view of who you are as a person and your voice. Your voice is very big in this. So my very quick secrets to an essay are first and foremost, you are the one writing your essay and it is in your voice. Parents, I know it's really hard to take a step back and let maybe that one comma splice or that one word go. This is the student's essay. Students speak with comma splices and with sometimes not completely appropriate language that you think is appropriate. We don't care. Students, keep in mind your audience. Admissions offices, as you can see from us and any college fair you've gone to, have a very wide range of professionals. They could be recent college graduates, they can be people who have been in the profession for 20 plus years. So if I have to explain who Drake is to all of my directors one more time, um, so keep those things in mind when you're writing. You're speaking just like you will be in the real world to a wide array of different people. So make sure that there's at least a little bit of it that is relatable and understandable to a wide array of people. My other tip would be to have someone other than those closest to you read your application. So maybe a teacher who maybe hasn't taught you for a year or so and might not necessarily be the person writing your recommendation, but they are someone that you really trust and value their opinion, they're gonna be the one to give you some really good feedback because they don't know you quite as well as the people who have literally been looking at your application for months on end. I haven't been looking at your application for months on end, I have about five minutes to read your application. I'm viewing it with the same lens as that person who maybe knows you kind of well, but not quite that you're besties with. Um, so keep that in mind too. It's okay to be boring. As was already pointed out, if it's about your birthday, I had one girl write about her love of gardening. Whatever it is, you don't need to knock her socks off. You're only a high schooler. We know you haven't like saved the world yet. If you have, write about it. But most of you have not, and that's okay. So if you enjoy knitting, or I had a student that races cars, like whatever it is, write about it, but do it in your own voice, because the most aggravating thing is when I feel like it's kind of inauthentic. Um, and for us, even with the volume of applications, we read every single essay, so definitely keep that in mind. So really quickly for parents and students, um, she mentioned the common application. There are different ways that you can apply to the colleges and universities. There is the common application where you would fill it out once and send it to multiple universities, and there is one essay that's required. There's also something called the coalition application, and then obviously schools have their own application. So can I just see hands raised if you accept the common app? Coalition? Oh, okay, great, thank you. All right, and then Georgia, I'll let you go ahead and answer those questions. So quickly, I like the positive things people have said, personal, heartfelt, 
essays are wonderful, the ones that we really get a feel for the student. Uh, a couple of things we don't want to see, so please, students, put your thesauruses down and not helping. Um, things that we read a lot, and it makes it hard for your essay to stand out. Uh, I don't know if you guys read a lot of The Big Game. Uh, I won The Big Game. I'm really happy for you. It's exciting. A lot of people win The Big Game. I lost the big game. I tore my ACL halfway through my junior year, but guys, I worked hard. I've rehabbed. I'm back on the team. That's great. We read a lot of those. It's hard for that to stand out. Um, I read a lot of mission trip essays, and again, that's wonderful. I'm so excited that we have students that are applying to our school and want to get out there and change the world. A lot of those experiences can read the same way, so it makes it, again, hard to stand out. Uh, lastly, last year, so we asked in our first essay for an amusing or interesting story. For some reason last year, students thought that meant bodily fluids. It does not. You know, I don't know your grandmother, but when you're writing this, please, you know, it should be something that my grandmother should be happy with. Being alone, last year I read 2,500 applications. Each one of those applications has four different essays, right? So very quickly, I can tell, like within two to three sentences, whether or not I'm reading what's called a cookie cutter essay. Where, you know, it says, oh, the campus of blank school is just so beautiful, and I can't wait to do this, that, and the other thing with that professor. It's, it stands out, it really, really does stand out. Additionally, I do want to repeat, you know, don't, don't repeat the same things that are going on in other um, parts of your essay. You know, it, this is your chance to stand out. This is your chance to say, like I said earlier, this is why I'm amazing. This is why I'm important. Through those four different essays, and the University of Michigan is a very writing-intensive university. We're not expecting you to be, you know, Pulitzer Prize-winning authors. We'll teach you how to do that later on. Um, but we are expecting you to be able to communicate. You know, communication is key to life, to being successful in business, to being successful in your relationships. And 
those people who can put down their ideas, what's going on inside of their head, into language on paper, they, they just stand out above others, right? So when I say keep it in perspective, you have to think, how am I going to stand out to Dustin? Because to echo man, yeah, you know, of those 10,000 essays, probably a good 2,000 of them were torn ACLs. <laughs> or more, yeah, you know. Um, one of our essay questions is asking you to talk about a community that you belong to and your role within it, right? So when I was writing that essay, my community was people who had scoliosis, right? Because I wasn't allowed to like play sports, you know, act so, uh, um, physical activities would leave me in pain, things like that. So I felt that I was very different. Every single one of you, parents included, all of you have something unique about you. So you have to really figure out what that is about you. And then that's what I would encourage you to write about. You know, now that I'm an adult, now that I'm reading these applications, you know, maybe my community would be men who have to wear beards because they don't have a chin. <laughs> we, we want you to think outside of the box. We, we're not expecting an academic five paragraph essay. Um, you, you know, and when we're sitting there for eight, nine, 10, 12 hours a day <laughs> reading applications, we're looking for excitement. We're looking for you to really say, you know, here's what makes me amazing. Thank you. All right, I have two more questions. Um, one is about recommendations, if you require them. Um, and oftentimes students will say to me, they require two, but I want to send more, can I? So how do you feel about extra recommendation? We can start with Georgia. So we do require a um, recommendation from your counselors. It's really important to help us understand your curriculum and what's going on in your school. We optionally accept, and I emphasize optionally, teacher recommendations. If you send them, I will read them. If you send me 16, I will begrudgingly read them. So, yeah, so optional teacher rec we do require recommendation from your counselor. Um, Drexel. So for Drexel, we require at least two, um, like UGA, one from your counselor. That gives us a really um, effective look at you academically through your entire time in high school. That's often sometimes a place where um, if you're having honest conversations with your counselors about maybe a struggle early on in your career and you don't quite feel comfortable writing about it, maybe your counselor can help shed some light on some of those things for us, so that's another place that we find helpful. Um, we also require um, at least one teacher from a core academic area, so your core subjects like science, um, English, math, foreign languages, all, anything core subject matter, um, and we ask for no more than four. So I will probably begrudgingly skim through if there's more than four, um, but four for us is kind of the magic number. And really it's who you are um, fittingly following um, Dustin, a member of your community. Who are you as a member of your school, your church community, your, your internship, your family unit, whatever it is. Um, often your teachers and counselors are picking up on more about you than you think that they are. Um, and so recommendations, quite like essays, um, are rarely, rarely, rarely ever going to hurt you, but they can help you tremendously. Marilyn. Um, so Marilyn only requires two. We just need your counselor and an academic teacher. Um, and we put that because that, that truly will give us a good insight as to who you are. We get the academic side of what you're like as a student and then the counselor who can kind of speak more holistically about you. Um, if you want to submit an additional one or two, um, we usually recommend just don't, just don't go crazy. As you've heard, we all have to read all these applications. There's a reason we pick a number because that's usually sufficient. Um, but I always tell students, if you're going to go over that, just be intentional. There's maybe a reason why you're adding an additional person. Maybe it's a supervisor or a coach or someone who knows another side of you that maybe nobody else knows and you just want that spoken to. That's totally fine. But like I said, don't go overwhelmingly throwing a ton there because, yeah, again, we have to read through all these and we're going to, but we might have to read a little faster than we would. Um, we only require the two. Um, I'll also say that um, the academic teacher 
if you, we don't care which academic class it is, um, but it could be a teacher that maybe you didn't do so hot in that class if they talk about your growth in that class. So that's okay too for us. Um, if, you're the, if you were a student who struggled in a class but picked up your grade, that might be a good person to ask. Um, and then if you're going for one of our limited enrollment programs, so engineering or business or computer science, um, it's a good idea to pick one of those teachers if you took a class in one of those areas um, because our limited enrollment programs get a second, uh, separate review by that department. Um, we review first and make our decision without considering major um, and whatever they say doesn't impact our decision. But again, it can, it can be helpful when they're reviewing if they do have a letter from that teacher to kind of see how you've done in that field. But again, we just need the two. Those are sufficient. If you go over it, um, it's not going to put you at an advantage or disadvantage. It's just, again, if you feel you need to, or <coughs> let's say if you are applying to other institutions, you've already asked for two teachers because other schools require it, that's fine. You can send them. They wrote the letter. You can send it to us. But typically, I just say be intentional. The University of Michigan only requires one academic teacher recommendation. Um, of course, I'm not going to stop you from submitting more, but uh, just to keep it short and sweet and echo what others have said, you know, as put it this way, sending in 13 letters of recommendation does not increase your chances of admission 13 times, right? So if, you know, if you do have other people who can provide a different side of you, by all means, have them send in a letter of recommendation, but truly just one can give us a good enough picture of who you are. Thank you. Yeah, and so for St. Mary's, uh, we require two, one from a counselor and one from another. So it could be a teacher, a coach, um, a supervisor, a mentor, anything of that nature. Uh, for recommenders, uh, luckily for our office, we receive a smaller load than the other schools up here. So we spend a little bit longer on reading our applications. I might spend almost 15 minutes in some cases. Um, so I'm really reading thoroughly through these, and if it's a letter of recommendation from a counselor, a lot of Maryland schools are really large, and your counselors, wonderful people that they are, could have caseloads of hundreds of students that they're writing these recommendation letters for. Um, so I would really encourage you that for that other recommendation, get someone that knows you very personally. You have the opportunity to utilize someone that doesn't even have to be a teacher. So if you haven't even made a strong relationship with a teacher that knows about your extracurriculars, knows about who you are as a person, as a student, as a worker, um, then go with someone that can express that and has the time to write a really thorough recommendation. Thank you. And then the last question. Um, obviously college is um, quite expensive, so if you can talk about any merit aid or scholarships and how students would go about applying for those or receiving those. And you can talk to Drexel and then just go down the line. So, this is true across the board for all of us. First and foremost is familiarize yourself not just with admissions deadlines, but financial aid deadlines, because they not, are not always the same, and some have certain contingencies with them, like the type of application you're applying with, so on and so forth. So now is a great time to start looking at websites, emailing your territory manager, talking to your counselors, whatever it is. Um, no matter what you think your financial situation is, you should always be looking to maximize the funding that you're receiving. Um, so for Drexel, we are a private institution, so we do award merit-based aid. Every student who applies is evaluated for merit-based aid. Um, we also award need-based aid on basis of two things, um, a CSS profile through the college board if you choose to submit one. Um, as a private institution, we utilize that to award institutional grant funding, which is free funding that does not need to be repaid. And of course, also the FAFSA, which is um, the federal document that we all accept. Um, be paying attention to the averages that, that schools are awarding. Ask questions. Do not be afraid to ask questions. Um, ask difficult questions, sorry I'm saying that, but please do. Um, this is a very large investment. We are aware of that, so we want to help you as early as possible in answering your questions and making you feel comfortable. Um, I thought of one other thing because we were talking about ED. If you're thinking about early decision, ED, 
please, please, please make sure you're feeling financially comfortable with that school um, because it is, again, binding. So make sure, especially in that situation, that you're asking all of the questions that you want to get answered because remember that if you're admitted, you will be attending that school. So University of Georgia, well, let me back up and say, if you're not already looking at third-party scholarships, please start looking at third-party scholarships. I know all the kids Students in here Friday night, you want to be filling out scholarship applications, all right? It's a it's a really good way, and they add up uh, even a little bit here and there can make a big difference. Um, with two exceptions at the University of Georgia, your application to our university doubles as your application for parent academic scholarships. If you're an academic rock star, if you've never made a B in your life and they're going to rename the SAT after you, come talk to me. Uh, otherwise, other things that you can look at, things like the academic common market, if you haven't already looked into that, depending on the major. If you're going out of state, we give you in-state tuition in some places, uh, some neat programs like that. But for us, mostly, we can apply to the work for academic and merit scholarship if we can give you money. Yeah, for state So similar to the others, uh, your application to the university doubles as your merit scholarship application. Of course, we do accept the FAFSA. Um, we also have the CSS profile for institutional uh, aid as well. In addition, we also have, through the university, called like, it's called My Scholarship Profile, which it's kind of like a 20-minute survey or so, but it's for all these various scholarships that are basically set up by alumni. So I got 500 bucks just because my dad was in the Marine Corps. Right? So it's it, the money is out there. Um, I, I would highly recommend there, there's a federal um, website. I believe it's collegescorecard.gov. You could Google it. Um, generally speaking, they, they post you know average debt for graduating students. You know average cost of uh, the total cost of the education, not just the tuition, but you know books and supplies and the board, all of that. Um, <clears throat> but above all of that, you know it's. Just speaking about education as a whole, our financial aid office and all of our financial aid offices are not there to make things scary or bad. They are there to make things easier. You know, we, we've got a lot of money. We want to give it to you. But in order for us to do that, you have to fill out the documents. And last, I'll try to keep it brief. So, uh, Maryland, if you want to be considered for federal aid, that's the free application for federal student aid. So, the FAFSA form, as you heard, Maryland's priority deadline is January 1st. Um, our academic scholarships, as I mentioned earlier, you're automatically considered if you apply by November 1st, no separate application. Um, students are typically notified after a decision is released by February 1st, so it's usually end of February, early March. Those can range anywhere from about 1500 all the way up to a full ride. So, uh, and those vary from year to year. It's all dependent upon the applicant pool. So we have a certain amount of money, and it'll depend on you know who's in the pool that year. But those are solely academic. So that's grades, test score, breaker. Outside of that, some of our academic colleges have their own set of money. So I just recommend students check those out. Our financial aid website has their uh, all those separate scholarships as well. And they also have links to our college websites and 
yes, you may be eligible for a scholarship coming in the door. You may not be eligible, but then you could look for a scholarship once you're a current student. So don't ever stop the scholarship search. When I went to college, I got an academic scholarship coming in the door, continue to search, and then I got an extra thousand for something that I applied for like my sophomore year. So just always keep on that process. Um, keep looking for these outside scholarships. Um, and then two final pieces, what I heard in the fall, apparently, so um, I know Naviance has some tools, we're on Coalition, I know Coalition has some college resource tools, I think um, Common App does now, but um, I've heard College Board um, on their website, it, they have some search tools as well, and I've heard that if you just utilize certain parts of their website as their college resources, you could potentially be eligible for being in the running for a scholarship just by using their resources. So just check out all these different websites, check with your counselors, they know a lot of different resources as well, but just do your homework. Um, and just keep in mind that um, we will, we want to give you the money, we want to do the best that we can, but every school is very, very different, and some of us as public institutions may not have all the money in the world, so just keep that in mind. Feel free to always have those conversations with us, but if it doesn't work out, please know we'd love to give you more money, um, but we may not have extra money. So just, just talk with us and we'll be honest with you, but um, every school as you heard is, is very different. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here this evening. I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Ocker. All right, we just wanna take an opportunity to just give our panelists a round of applause for all of you. We have a lot of resources. The, the uh, start of college has already started for our juniors in terms of working with counselors, registering for classes. That'll continue to go on in the summer and the beginning of next year. But we do encourage you to please make sure that you talk with um, your child's counselor. They really are the best resource as you continue on to this journey. But again, I want to thank you all for coming out. And that concludes our evening. Thank you very much. Thank you.